Welcome back. Uh, see, we have learnt about the fluid mechanics, but we also know that whenever we are doing some processing, that heat transfer becomes an integral part, whether, whether we are cooling or a, a fluid or heating, or when the fluid is flowing through the pipelines, there could be external heat leak which can heat up the fluid, or there could be some other cooling down processes. So, and also we are using many types of heat exchangers during the processing of the natural gas. In each of these cases, we need to know how the heat transfer takes place within a medium or between two media. So, for this we will be looking into some basics of the heat transfer which would be necessary for evaluation and analysis of the various types of processes in the natural gas systems. So, we shall be talking about heat transfer in natural gas systems. In this particular lecture, we shall be learning about heat transfer in natural gas systems then various modes of heat transfer like conductive heat transfer, convective heat transfer, radiative heat transfer. So, let us first figure out that where do we encounter heat transfer in natural gas systems. Now, this heat transfer occurs during cooling or heating as I told you of the various types of process fluids during storage because whenever we are storing the natural gas, it is sometimes stored uh, in a liquid form. So, so, we need to take out the um, extra heat, so that it can be condensed to liquid or during the um, storage of the liquefied natural gas, the from external um, surroundings, there will be uh, some heat flux, which will be going inside the storage tank and that will cause some evaporation of the natural gas. So, there also we need to know that what is the heat flux from the ambient into the storage tank and later on the various types of transport of various streams the, where there will be some kind of heat transfer involved. Now, as I said that by the knowledge of heat transfer, we can design the heat exchangers or the mass exchangers like absorber, adsorber, distillation column etcetera. Then we have insulation system, then transport lines and the storage system. For designing of each of these components, we need to have some understanding of the heat transfer. Now, first let us see that what is meant by heat transfer. Heat transfer is the transfer of thermal energy due to thermal non-equilibrium within a medium or among adjacent media. That means, the heat transfer will be taken in terms of only thermal energy transfer and not any energy form because we know that energy can exist in various forms like sound energy is another form of energy. So, but this heat transfer is mainly concerned with only thermal energy transfer and that is due to a thermal non-equilibrium. So, whenever a system is under not under thermal equilibrium that means, there will be some kind of gradient in the system or with between two systems. So, due to this non-equilibrium there could be this heat transfer taking place. Now, heat transfer may be within a single phase for example, within a gas or a liquid or a solid or in a multi phase systems. For example, we have brick in the brick we know that brick is a porous material and the voidage that is the void fraction in the brick is about 20 percent that is it has both solid phase as well as a gaseous phase coexisting, and that is how it becomes a multi phase system and there will be some kind of heat transfer through the brick. So, this also is a multi phase system heat transfer. And thermal non equilibrium between two media an example we can see from day to day life that suppose we are having a glass of water at ambient condition and in that we add ice say from refrigerator into the water. And if we add it the ice may be at uh, very low temperature 0 degree, centi 0 degree centigrade and what at ambient temperature. So, because of these two di temperature differences there is non-equilibrium between the two systems. So, what we observe that the water will tend to cool down whereas, the ice will tend to melt and, and slowly it will also raise its temperature. So, because of these differences in the temperature where th there will be heat transfer between the liquid water and the solid ice. Now, the temperature variation is governed by 
law of energy conservation and what is this energy conservation we know that this law says that energy can neither be destroyed nor can be generated or created now but it can change its form it can be converted from one form to another and we can see this in our day to day life like here we have different forms of energy like mechanical energy thermal energy electromagnetic energy electrical energy chemical energy nuclear energy now here we see that for example mechanical energy now mechanical energy is used by us for every human being or the animals for their movement so for here we have seen a, shown a frog which is leaping and it is using the mechanical energy similarly a car driving is using mechanical energy then we have thermal energy for thermal energy like the melting of the ice cream is a thermal energy then we have heating of some kind of material like water like when we are making tea or we are heating up milk coffee etc they all are coming to thermal energy then we have electromagnetic energy in this we have the visible light we have infrared radiation which we use many a times for uh, for medical purposes for fermentation and then we have radio waves then we have electrical energy and this electrical energy as you see that we are using electrical energy for heating up there uh, our geysers we are using electrical energy to heat up water so here we have from lightning also lightning in the um, during the rainy season lightning also produces electrical energy and when we have power lines so these are all using the electrical energy and then we have chemical energy due to the combustion of some material or the food we are intaking that food is also getting combusted inside our body and producing energy for our activities so that is that is why it is shown food that is food is using the chemical energy and then we have the nuclear energy that is coming by fusion and fission that is that from solar energy for example that is coming through the nuclear fusion and then we have nuclear fusion fission that is in, which is happening inside the core of the earth so this is how we find that we have we are dealing with various types of energy in our day to day life for various types of activities in this particular figure we are showing that how a particular energy is getting converted from one form to the other during a process here we have showing that there is some kind of missile which is being is shot um, uh, shooting some missile is being sh shot here and initially we have the chemical energy and as the missile is moving up what we are finding that it is gaining the potential energy and the kinetic energy and the total energy remains conserved that is it is the constant now as it moves up at certain point of time that we find that it will go to a particular height and then it will again start coming down as it starts coming down we find that it loses the potential energy but gains in the kinetic energy and ultimately when it hits the target what happens the chemical energy within the missile gets converted to heat energy so that is how we see that how this particular missile is gaining the kinetic energy gaining the potential energy and again losing them and ultimately the chemical energy is coming into effect which is causing the heating up of the material and this heat we know that this causes explosion and by this explosion we many destruction takes place so when whenever we want to analyze this kind of uh, energy conservation which is also the statement of the first law of thermodynamics it says that it pertains to a particular system and we call it a control volume this we perhaps know that rate of energy change in a system is given as the rate of energy going into the system minus the rate of energy coming out of the system plus rate of work done by the system minus the rate of work done on the system the rate of energy generation inside the system minus rate of energy consumption inside the system the energy generation or consumption may occur due to some kind of reactions like fusion fusion or some kind of chemical reactions if there is no chemical reaction or any kind of this kind of fusion or fission we generally neglect the consumption or the generation of the energy work done as you know that 
we in his to get the work uh, to we do the work on a system to uh, to um, or we can get the work out of the system also like in case of pump or compressors we are doing work on the system whereas for the turbines we uh, the work is produced by the turbine so in this way also we find there will be some energy change inside the system now the um, energy transfer is a path function by path function we mean that whenever there is a energy transfer the a system can go from one state to the other now by the the way the energy is getting transferred the within these two states we will find the amount of energy required will be different means we can take different ways of going from one state to the other for example if we are heating up from one temperature to other we can heat up either we can heat up by say, um, say um, some some any means like electrical heating or we can do some chemical heating huh? so various ways i can heat up the system and for each of these systems i will find i will be requiring different amount of energies so that is how the energy becomes a in uh, heat transfer becomes a path function now there are different ways the heat can get transferred and these ways are broadly classified into three ways that is conduction then convection and radiation so we know that what is conduction in the conduction heat uh, heat transfer what happens in case of solids here what we are showing that in a solid the vibrations of the molecules in the lattice and the energy transport by the free electrons so these are the two modes by which within a solid we find that the energy gets transferred the lattice means a particular structure which holds the various molecules inside the solid and there's a maybe some free electrons which will moving freely here and there and depending on the number of free electrons available the rate of uh, conduction will change and similarly we also have uh, conductive heat transfer in the liquids and gases and in this case we know that in case of liquids and gases the molecules are held loosely because of which they have random motions so this the random motions causes collisions between the uh, liquids and solids and there is diffusion that means penetration of one uh, molecule into the other molecules so this way what happens both collisions and diffusions they help in the conductive heat transfer within the liquid and gas and that is how this mechanism of conductive heat transfer in liquids and solids is different from the mechanism the of conductive heat transfer in a solid next we come to the convective heat transfer in the convective heat transfer we know that energy transfer is happening between a solid surface and some adjacent fluid in motion now this is very important for us to know that in this case the fluid must be in motion if it is stagnant fluid then it will be only conductive but when there, there is a motion involved so it will be both conductive and convective which will come into picture and if the fluid flow becomes more and more the convective the heat transfer becomes more and more dominating over the conductive heat transfer so the faster the and more vigorous the fluid motion the greater is the uh, heat transfer due to convection and here we have that uh, two types of convection one is the natural convection and there is the forced convection natural convection occurs due to the buoyancy force and buoyancy force comes into effect whenever there is a density difference so for example if there is some uh, whenever we are heating a water in a pot or a oven what we find the water which is in touch with the surface of the oven will get heated up and its density will decrease and that's how it will try to move up whereas the water which is away from the kettle surface kettle wall will be at a lower temperature so its density will be more so it will tend to come down so because of the density difference there will be a motion which will come into effect that that is the water the cooler water from the top will come down and the hotter water from the bottom will move up so this is the natural convection here it is shown that the hot egg 
and air is there. So, the hot egg is uh, the air near the hot egg is getting heated up and thus its density is decreasing whereas, the air away from the egg is uh, having lower temperature. So, that is denser. So, what will happen? There will be a convective current from the uh, egg to into the air. And then we have the forced convection. In this, we find that with the the medium is forced to to move. Here we have shown it by some fan. So whenever we are having hot egg, what we do? Sometimes we switch on the fan. So what if whenever we want to cool something, say we want to cool milk or we want to cool some food, what we do? We switch on the fan at our home. And by switching on the fan, what we are doing? We are trying to give the convective heat transfer and this convective heat transfer that is causing the forced convection over the hot surface and that is how we find that the material the hot material will get cooled down faster than when it is under natural convection. And here we have shown the a picture where we find that how the natural convection can be seen in nature. Here we find that there we have a sea and there we have hot land. Now, what happens the cold air we tend to go towards this hot land and because of the sun there will be this this air near this one will be heated up. So, the hot air which will try to move up and then as it moves up it gets colder and colder and then as it gets colder it its density increases and now it will tend to come down and as it tends to come down again this this air gets cooled and again it moves towards the hot uh, land and this way there is a circulatory motion which starts in this particular uh, way and we get this uh, warm and hot air circulating over the land and the sea. Next we come to radiative heat transfer. The radiative heat transfer occurs in entirely different manner and it occurs due to the electromagnetic waves. Now, whenever there are electromagnetic waves we do not need any kind of material medium that is we do not need any solid or liquid or gas. It can also occur in a vacuum due to the uh, existence of the electromagnetic waves. After learning about these two three modes of heat transfer next we come to a combined heat transfer effect which we see in the nature that the sun's ray is causing radiative heat transfer which enters the atmosphere and it heats up tends to heat up all the uh, water bodies of land. Then we have conduction in this conduction what is happening that the ground is absorbing the heat from the sun and the air is which is in touch with the ground is getting heated up by the conduction and then this air is going to the sky and it is forming the uh, along with it it is also carrying the water vapor which is forming the cloud. So, this this is occurring due to the convection. So, here we find in the nature that how radiation, conduction and convection take place simultaneously. After learning about these three modes of heat transfer in brief, now we go to again some rudimentary analysis of these three modes of heat transfer. First we come to the conductive heat transfer. In the conductive heat transfer we go with the Fourier's law of heat conduction. Now, in this case the rate of heat conduction depends on the geometry of the material, the thickness of the material through which the heat is getting transferred, the material of construction because there is some particular property thermal conductivity which depends on the material and the temperature difference. So, this can be written like this the rate of heat conduction is proportional to the area for heat transfer, the temperature difference and inversely proportional to the thickness of the material that is the more the thickness the less the rate of conductive heat transfer. Here we have shown the material of certain thickness delta x and there is a temperature gradient T 1 to T 2, T 1 is more than T 2 and this is the surface area through which the heat transfer Q dot is taking place. So, if I put this we put this thing we find that we can replace the proportionality constant with a uh, proportionality with the pressure constant k and this k this k is the thermal conductivity of the material and in the extreme when delta x that is the thickness of the material 
tends towards 0 that is goes very very small then this delta t by delta x is given by d t by d x. So, this particular um, equation is the Fourier's law of heat conduction and the thermal conductivity is the ability of a material to um, transfer heat through itself by conduction. So, it, it, it has a, a SI unit of watt per meter per Kelvin. The value of this thermal conductivity is a function of both temperature and pressure of the system and it is a function also of the materials. And as we know, there are various types of materials uh, like very highly conductive materials like pure metals, silver, aluminum, zinc, etcetera. And then we have very, very um, low conductivity material like non-metallic solids, uh, ice, plastics, fibers, etcetera. Then we have insulations, then we have liquids and lastly the gases are the ones which have the lowest of the thermal conductivities. So, depending on the type of material we find that the it can have very high thermal conductivity to very low thermal conductivity. And this thermal conductivity may be estimated from various types of correlations which are developed from experimental data. Next we come to the convective uh, heat transfer analysis. Here we use the Newton's law of cooling or heating and this is uh, says that the rate of the convective heat transfer is directly proportional to temperature difference and the area of heat transfer. Now, here is the statement that Q naught is equal dot is the uh, proportional to area and the temperature difference and the proportionality is replaced by a proportionality constant that is H and this H is the heat transfer coefficient unlike the thermal conductivity heat transfer coefficient is not a property of the material, but a property of the system as a whole that is how the particular fluid is moving, what kind of geometry it is moving through. These all dictate the value of the heat transfer coefficient. So, here we see that it is a function of the type of convection that is natural convection or forced convection, nature of the flow whether the flow is laminar, turbulent or pulsating flow etcetera then what kind of fluid we are handling whether it is gas or liquid and the geometry of the surface. It is sometimes also called film coefficient or film effectiveness and it is also estimated from various types of correlations for various types of systems. The SI unit of this is watt per meter square per Kelvin. To estimate the heat transfer coefficient generally many non-dimensional numbers are proposed some of them are given here like Nusselt number is the ratio of the convective heat transfer to the conductive heat transfer in the material and is given by N u as H l by k, H is the heat transfer coefficient, L is the characteristic length and k is the thermal conductivity of the fluid. Then we have the Prandtl number which is the ratio of the viscous diffusion rate to the thermal diffusion rate that is mu C p by k. Then we have Reynolds number that is the in a ratio of the inertial force to the viscous force and given by density of the fluid, the velocity of the fluid, the characteristic length divided by the dynamic viscosity of the fluid and we have Grashof number which is used in case of natural convection and is the ratio of the buoyancy force to the viscous force and is given by particular this formula. Now, all these these are some of the non-dimensional numbers which are used to find uh, represent the heat transfer coefficient and here we are giving you uh, some heat transfer coefficient correlations for forced convection. Here we have shown for different cases like this is for the laminar flow over a flat plate and then we have the turbulent flow over a flat plate with uniform surface temperature. Then we have turbulent flow over a flat plate with uniform heat flux and then we have flow inside a pipe. Now, you can see here that in most of the cases there is a Reynolds number and Prandtl number are coming into picture for the forced convection and you see the various types of coefficient values are 
there for various types of flow and in this particular last one we see that depending on whether the fluid is getting heated or getting cooled we have different uh, power of the Prandtl number this is for a flow through inside a pipe. Now, we have the heat transfer co uh, coefficient correlation for natural convection here we see that the Nusselt number is given in terms of the Grashof number and the Prandtl number that is for the natural convection Grashof number replaces the Reynolds number which is used in the forced convection. Again we have different types of correlations for vertical plate, for horizontal plate and for sphere for the natural convection. Lastly, we go to the analysis of radiative heat transfer. Here we have the famous um, uh, equation this is given by uh, the this equation here we have for the emissivity this emissivity is defined as the effectiveness of a surface in emitting the energy as thermal radiation and it is a ratio of the thermal radiation emitted from the surface to the radiation from an ideal black surface perhaps all of you know that black body are those bodies which absorb all the radiations uh, incident on it and the emissivity varies from 0 to 1. And here we in this particular table we have the emissivities of various types of materials from the metals to the non metals and to the uh, liquids. Then we have the Stephen Boltzmann constant and a shape factor which depends on the orientation of the surfaces 1 and 2 from between which the radiative heat transfer is taking place. This 1 and 2 represent two surfaces and this shape factor is the fraction of the radiation leaving a surface that is intercepted by another surface and it is generally obtained from some charts and it is also called view factor or orientation factor and here we find the charts are given to find out the value of the uh, shape factor and here we find the dimensions are given we have to know the dimensions of the particular system of the two surfaces a1 and a2 and we just find out these ratios and with the ratios we can find out the values of this f12 this is the shape factor so with these values then we can use use in this particular formula and t1 and t2 are the two temperatures of surfaces 1 and 2. With this we, we see that we uh, look into the various types of um, uh, heat transfer that, that takes place and more of this can be found from the following references. Thank you.